Your line is now unmuted. Welcome, and thank you for joining today's Chief FOIA Officer Council meeting. Before we begin, please ensure you've opened the WebEx participant and chat panel, please in the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. Please note that all audio connections are muted at this time. You are, however, welcome to submit written questions throughout today's presentation. To submit a written question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, enter your question in the message box provided, and send. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. With that, I'm going to turn things over to Alina Simo, Director of Office of Government Information Services. Please go ahead. Thanks, Tegan. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our second Virtual Chief Foyer Officers Council meeting, and perhaps not our last. Uh, I hope everyone has been staying healthy, safe, and well. I am Alina Simo, Director of the Office of Government Information Services and Co-Chair of the Council. Let me introduce my co-chair, Bobby Talibian, Director of the Office of Information Policy at the Department of Justice. Bobby? Thank you so much, Alina, and thank you all for uh, joining us. We're looking forward to a great agenda um, and meeting today. We do have a full agenda today. Um, in a minute, you will hear welcoming remarks from Archivist of the United States, David Ferriero. Bobby and I will provide an overview of the Chief Boy Officer's landscape for new CFOs that are joining us for the first time today. Uh, that will be followed by some updates from both OIP and this. You will next here from the Council's two committees, the Technology Committee and the Committee on Cross-Agency Collaboration and Innovation. You will want to stay tuned in for a presentation from the Chair and Vice Chair of the Chief Data Officers Council. We are excited to have them join us later this morning. Uh, during the course of the meeting, we will pause and check in to see if there are any questions from our agency FOIA colleagues that come in via chat. We are also simultaneously live streaming today's meeting on the NARA YouTube channel, and we will, we will be monitoring the chat functions both on WebEx and YouTube, so please chat any questions you may have. We have reserved time at the end of today's session for public comments. We will be opening the telephone lines at the end of our meeting for the last 15 minutes for any oral questions or comments from the public. We are monitoring the chat on WebEx and the NARA YouTube channel. We will read out loud any substantive questions or comments we receive from the public. At this time, I would like to introduce Archivist of the United States, David Ferriero. Thank you, Alina. Good morning and welcome to from 700 Pennsylvania Avenue, where we would ordinarily be meeting. And I very much look forward to the day when we will actually welcome you back to this building. The National Archives is a shrine to American democracy and plays an important role in the Freedom of Information Act landscape. The National Archives is home to both the Federal FOIA Ombudsman Office, OGIS, and to the Office of the Chief Records Officer of the United States Government. As senior officials tasked with ensuring agency FOIA compliance, you know firsthand the crucial link between an excellent records management program and an efficient, responsive FOIA program. April 13th marked the 106th birthday of the late U.S. Representative John Moss of California, who worked for six congressional sessions, 12 years, to get the original FOIA through Congress. In urging his House colleagues to vote for the measure in 1966, Representative Moss said, we must remove every barrier to information about an understanding of government activities consistent with our security if the American public is to be adequately equipped to fulfill the ever more demanding role of responsible citizenship. Fifty-five years later, FOIA continues to play a role in helping Americans fulfill what Representative Moss called the demanding role of responsible citizenship though it's, it is important to note that one need not be a citizen to file a FOIA request. In fiscal year 2020, requesters submitted more than 790,000 FOIA requests to federal departments and agencies. Fulfilling these requests became, becomes more and more challenging as the amount of government information and data swells. Last summer, one of the four federal advisory committees here at the National Archives the FOIA Advisory Committee delivered to me 22 recommendations for improving FOIA administration. 
Two of those recommendations are directed at the Chief FOIA Officers Council. I'm pleased that the Council has already established a committee on cross-agency collaboration and innovation, and I look forward to learning more about its agenda in the coming year, as well as the work of the Technology Committee. Many of you have not been back in your offices since early March 2020. The last year has challenged all of us, but it has also created opportunities to look at new ways of doing things. And I hope today's meeting sparks thought of op about opportunities for finding innovative ways to administer FOIA. As we enter our second year of physically distancing ourselves from one another, please continue to take care and stay safe. And I now turn the meeting back to Alina. David, thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Uh, Tegan, next slide, please. At this time, Bobby and I would like to spend a few minutes providing an overview of the CFO landscape and CFO Council. Uh, Bobby, over to you. Bobby, I think you're muted. Please unmute yourself. I'm sorry. I, I, I was just saying, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, a, a good morning again. Um, and so uh, Alina and I, we thought uh, since we have so many new CFOs joining us, uh, we're looking forward to, I'm looking forward to meeting our new CFOs and also uh, thanking our veteran CFOs uh, for joining us for today's meeting. Um, that we would take this opportunity to just briefly review uh, the role, the important roles of the agency chief FOIA officer and the chief FOIA officer council. Uh, the role of the CFO uh, actually was first established by an executive order, but then later codified uh, in the FOIA by the Open Government Act of 2007. And the FOIA specifically requires that each agency designate a chief FOIA officer who should be at the senior official, it should be a senior official at the assistant secretary or equivalent level. Over the years, uh, we have certainly seen uh, the importance of this role uh, and how critical it is in, in agency success in administering all aspects of the FOIA, from proactive disclosures to responding to requests. Uh, and in 2019, the Department of Justice issued a memo asking agencies to review uh, their chief FOIA officer position to ensure that it is at the appropriate level. Um, and so, uh, we, um, we then follow that up by uh, asking agencies to regularly review that position in their chief FOIA officer reports. Next slide. The FOIA has specific responsibilities that it provides for the chief FOIA officers, uh, but overall the chief FOIA officer role is meant to be a senior official responsible for ensuring the overall effectiveness and efficiency of your FOIA programs. The responsibilities listed here on this slide are directly from the statute, um, but as you can see, essentially the CFO uh, should be in a position where they are regularly able to monitor uh, all aspects of the agency's FOIA administration uh, and then provide either, um, or, uh, either make changes or provide recommendations to the head of the agency uh, to make adjustments in practices, policies, personnel, and funding uh, that may be necessary to ensure uh, that you're continuing to improve your FOIA administration. Uh, and also making sure that your agency is efficient and it's efficient and appropriately applying the law. Of course, uh, uh, we also look forward to working with the new chief FOIA officers uh, and continue to work with our veteran chief FOIA officers here at the department. Uh, and each year, agencies report to the Department of Justice They're through their chief FOIA officer report on five key areas of FOIA administration, uh, in implementing a presumption of openness, having effective systems for responding to requests, utilizing technology, improving our, uh, continuing to increase proactive disclosures, and improving if, um, efficiency and timeliness. Next slide. So uh, the next two slides I'm, um, I'm going to cover uh, continue the many responsibilities of the chief boy officers. And by now, I'm sure everyone is really exhausted. There's a lot to do. Um, we are definitely aware that CFOs not only have a large number of responsibilities under the FOIA, but that CFOs also wear several other hats 
at your respective agencies. So uh, we know there's a lot going on and you have a lot to juggle. But I wanted to highlight three bullets on this page. Um, training all agency staff, not only the FOIA personnel at your agency, uh, and reminding that FOIA is everyone's responsibility, um, remains critical um, even today. And we do hope you will serve as our primary agency liaison with my office and Bobby's. Um, but again, we understand you may need to delegate that um, so long as we know who that is. But um, please uh, check in with us, and we're here to help you. Uh, and we thank you for designating FOIA public liaisons. Requesters tell us having a good FOIA public liaison makes a world of difference. Next slide, please. So on this next slide, uh, continuation of the CFO's responsibilities. Most agencies' FOIA regulations are up to date by now, but it, it is important to keep up with any changes that require updates to regulation. And proactive disclosures um, is a topic that the CFO Council has discussed in the past and that continues to be very important. And you'll be hearing about that um, at, at various points from us today. And of course, near and dear to my heart, dispute resolution services with OGIS um, or the FOIA public liaison it remains very critical and a very important part of what OGIS does. Next slide, please. And of course, as uh, members of the, uh, as, as Chief FOIA officers, you are a member of the Chief FOIA Officer Council and our council meeting today. Um, the council is formally um, uh, structured to have uh, Alina and I, the directors of OIP at the Department of Justice and the director of OGIS at National Archives to be the co-chairs and comprises of uh, the de deputy director of management at OMB as well as each agency chief FOIA officer that's joining us today. Uh, the FOIA also allows us to, um, as co-chairs, to designate other employees or officials. Um, while this is the formal construct construct of the uh, Chief Boy Officer Council, uh, we could not have the success we've had uh, with this council and across all of the initiatives that we had without all the hard work of the FOIA officials that have joined us in these public meetings and uh, have served in the committees and all the work that we're going to discuss today. Next slide. So the FOIA also details specific responsibilities for the Chief FOIA Officer Council, and these are directly from the statute. Uh, to develop recommendations for increasing compliance and efficiency, uh, sharing best practices and innovative approaches to FOIA, identifying and developing initiatives to increase transparency, uh, and promoting common performance measures. All in all, these responsibilities just underscore uh, the opportunity that we have here with the Council and, and how um, uh, leveraging uh, to leverage all of our experiences across 118 agencies across the government that are implementing the law. Uh, to share best practices, uh, learn from each other, cross-collaborate, uh, and find new ways to both uh, make sure that we are all uh, meeting the core purpose of the FOIA uh, and improving uh, our administration of the FOIA um, for the, the, the large volumes of requests agencies are getting from year to year. So we look forward to uh, talking a little bit about um, what we've done uh, for these responsibilities and also building on those. Next slide. So this may be a little a repetitive of what Bobby has already said, but the Council is, again, a great opportunity for us to share updates from both OIP and OGIS and share best practices with each other and learn from each other. Um, and also for the Council committees, I'm very excited that we now have two committees, um, to provide updates uh, on their work. And as we will see later this morning, uh, it's a great opportunity for us to collaborate with other federal councils. Uh, today you will hear from the Chief Data Officers Council, and we hope that in the future we'll have other councils come and join us as well and present about their work. Next slide, please. So I am excited uh, to report that Council now has stood up two committees. For a couple of years, only one committee existed. They started out as the Technology Subcommittee, and then we promoted them to a full committee. Um, the Committee on Cross-Agency Collaboration and Innovation is our newcomer, and we are going to hear from them later today. Uh, you will hear from both sets of co-chairs, actually, today, and we are very grateful for the work the co-chairs have already put in and, uh, and will be putting in in the future. 
And please consider volunteering for one of the committees. You will be joining other FOIA colleagues who are passionate about improving the FOIA landscape overall. So um, you'll see contact information for the committee co-chairs uh, later, and uh, don't be shy. Sign up. Next slide, please. Bobby, over to you. Thank you. Uh, and, and then lastly, both uh, OIP and OGIS uh, serve as an important resource to agencies. Uh, and so we wanted to highlight for our new CFOs um, uh, uh, some uh, points about our office and the, and the resources uh, and how we can help with your agency. So OIP is responsible uh, for encouraging agency compliance with the FOIA uh, and the department's FOIA guidelines, as well as overseeing agency FOIA administration. And we do this, uh, we, we carry this mission out in a number of ways, by issuing policy guidance on uh, all aspects of FOIA administration, uh, holding workshops and, and sharing best practices, uh, providing training, uh, as Alina mentioned, uh, the, um, the chief FOIA officer is responsible for ensuring that agencies have sufficient training both for uh, FOIA professionals and uh, program personnel that are responsible uh, for uh, helping their agency implement the law. Uh, here at the Department of Justice, we provide established training for both FOIA and non-FOIA professionals, but we also are available in our, uh, to come to you uh, these days virtually and provide tailored training specific to, to your agency and your agency's needs. Uh, we also manage your agency's FOIA reporting obligations um, and provide legal advice, uh, confidential, provide individual legal advice on FOIA matters through our FOIA counselor service line. Next slide. A number of resources available on our website to, to you and um, all of our agency FOIA colleagues here. Uh, on our website, we have all of our FOIA policy guidance, the Department of Justice Guide to the FOIA, which is a comprehensive legal treatise on all aspects of the law, from uh, procedural requirements, proactive disclosures, to uh, exemption applicability. Uh, we regularly provide uh, summaries of new court decisions so that agencies are up to date on the latest uh, status of the law. And all of this is on our FOIA website. You can also follow us on our FOIA blog post uh, and, and on for any new events, training, or uh, any, 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 any new events regarding FOIA. Uh, we also have FOIA training resources on our website that you can use at your agency, as well as a self-assessment toolkit um, for objectively looking at your agency's FOIA programs. Also, the, we manage, which I'll get to a little bit later, uh, FOIA.gov, which is the central gov the government central website for FOIA. Next slide. Back to you, Lena. Thanks, Bobby. Um, so this is uh, the world of, of OGIS, um, all in one slide. While the concept of dispute resolution as a way to improve customer service and the FOIA process has been around for a number of years, Congress embraced dispute resolution in the Open Government Act of 2007 and created OGIS with the passage of the Open Government Act of 2007. And at the time of the passage and since, Congress has referred to us as the FOIA Ombudsman. We formally opened our doors in September 2009, and the statute uh, gives us two very clear missions. First, we are responsible for reviewing agencies' FOIA policies, procedures, and compliance with the FOIA statute and identifying procedures and methods for improving FOIA compliance. We do so in a variety of ways, including targeted agency assessments, more general issue assessments, through our work on the FOIA Advisory Committee, which I chair and which I will discuss a bit later uh, this morning, and our work on this council, the Chief FOIA Officers Council. I invite you to visit the compliance section of our website. There you will find the 14 agency-specific assessments we have conducted so far, as well as eight issue assessments. Second, we are charged with providing mediation services to help resolve disputes between requesters and federal agencies as a non-exclusive alternative to litigation. Last year, we received over 4,000 requests for assistance. The first thing to know about our dispute resolution program is that we do not dictate solutions or tell agencies they have to turn over records. Our mediation services are completely voluntary, and we have had both agencies and requesters participate or decline to participate. Most often, we act as a facilitator to help agencies and requesters better understand the issues and the other party's position. 
The statute specifically says our mediation services are a non-exclusive alternative to litigation. We try to prevent litigation by explaining the FOIA process, how the search was conducted, or an explanation of records withheld under each of the exemptions. But there's nothing in the statute that prevents a requester from filing a suit after going through our process. Generally, once the case is in litigation, we are no longer involved. But a lot of times, the explanations we provide help requesters get a better understanding of the agency's response. So we also look to the agency to help us provide more detailed explanation. A number of requesters have told us that after they've worked with us, they understand why the information was withheld or why the agency searched to not locate any records. So, in short, we believe OGIS does work. Other activities include outreach, regular meetings with our stakeholders, participating in a range of training and teaching activities. Uh, and I want to pause and just note that up until the pandemic, we had been providing in-person training to help agency FOIA professionals prevent and resolve disputes without the need to involve OGIS. Our training program on dispute resolution skills for agency FOIA professionals was extremely well regarded and in high demand. However, the pandemic has caused us to retool and refocus our training, and we are working to move to an online virtual experience platform. We look forward to being able to roll that out in the not too distant future. Next slide, please. Please follow us through our regular blog posts and our Twitter feed and visit our website, which is listed here um, on the slide, for more information. Next slide, please. So we're going to pause for a minute, Bobby, um, just to check in with Martha to see if we have any questions on the chat so far. No questions so far, other than things that I've addressed okay. in the chat. Terrific, thank you. So it sounds like everything's crystal clear. All right, Bobby, back over to you. Thank you, Alina. Um, so we'll move on to the next item on our agenda. Uh, if we go to the next slide. And so we wanted to provide, I wanted to provide some updates uh, and some reminders of some of the, uh, some uh, of um, recent work and upcoming initiatives. Next slide. First, as uh, many of you know, uh, we in last uh, last month, uh, agencies published all of their annual FOIA report data as well as their chief FOIA officer reports. Um, as you can see here, all the well, all the data has been uploaded to the FOIA.gov, and as you can see here, just uh, as far as request number of requests received and process government wide, agencies are still receiving a high a high number and um, over seven hundred thousand uh, requests received and processed. Uh, we did have a little bit of a dip there, but uh, as illustrated uh, in a lot of the chief FOIA officer reports, um, can, uh, a lot of factors um, contributing to that, including the pandemic. Next slide. So some upcoming uh, reminders uh, and, uh, uh, of uh, FOIA reporting. First, I want to thank all the agencies and agency officials who've been working on their annual FOIA report uh, for this past year and their chief FOIA officer report. Uh, especially the annual report, I know, is a, uh, is a, is a large uh, undertaking for a lot of agencies to validate and clear that data. Uh, and so we thank all the agencies who worked on their data last year and were able to timely um, provide their reports to the public so that we could load them on FOIA.gov. We look forward to, as in prior years, issuing a summary of government-wide annual FOIA report data um, very soon. We'll also this summer be issuing our annual summary and assessment of agencies 2021 Chief Four Officer Reports uh, and issuing any uh, guidance based off the results of those reports. So please stay tuned for that. Also, uh, this summer we'll provide uh, agencies with new reporting guidelines for the 2022 Chief Four Officer Reports. All of this will be published on our FOIA blog post and on our website. So please follow our uh, blog, uh, our FOIA post um, for, uh, um, for for, for uh, notices about these uh, events. Next slide. Of course, we continue to work on FOIA.gov, uh, the central website for FOIA, for, for the public, for um, the federal government's FOIA administration. Uh, just a brief recap, you know, 2011, we launched FOIA.gov uh, as an open government initiative to uh, serve as a dashboard for your agency's inner FOIA report data so that 
the public and agencies could easily uh, review the annual FOIA report data in open formats and in ways that they could compare um, your data over time and across agencies. We quickly built on that to make sure that the FOIA.gov served as more than just a dashboard, but a central resource for the public to uh, not only learn about your agency's FOIA operations through your annual FOIA report data, but also more important to learn about the FOIA process, um, have a place where they could search for records um, that have been posted that might help uh, uh, either um, uh, meet their rec records request needs or find the right agency to make the request, and also um, to, uh, to uh, have, um, well, in 2018, then, we launched the National FOIA Portal on FOIA.gov, which, add, which added the functionality allowing requesters to not only um, have access to significant uh, information and resources about each agency's FOIA administration, but have the ability to be able to make a request to any agency uh, through this one single site. In 2019, in order to achieve that goal, uh, DOJ and OMB issued guidance uh, for achieving interoperability with the FOIA, National FOIA Portal. Um, and that directive uh, requires that agencies, unless uh, provided an exception by the end of this fiscal year, become fully interoperable with the FOIA. Next slide. So we have been working directly with your agencies to ensure that you're on the path to be able to become interoperable. But as a reminder, there's two forms of interoperability with the National FOIA Portal. Um, if your agency has an automated case management system, you're required to uh, uh, work to implement our the AP, FOIA.gov API so that the requests that are made through FOIA.gov to your agency are directly ingested into your case management system. Agencies with non-automated solutions, primarily those agencies with very small numbers of requests, um, are required to achieve full interoperability by being able to accept from FOIA.gov a structured email that provides the request. As I mentioned, the directive requires that agencies become interoperable with um, either of these uh, uh, approaches by the end of this fiscal year. Uh, and we'll, we'll continue to work with and communicating with the agencies to make sure you can meet this requirement. Uh, I encourage you to please reach out to us um, if you have any questions or any issues arise as you're working to achieve interoperability. Next slide. We've also been working on enhancing and, uh, and, and building on our work on the site, um, on, on different pages of the site. Specifically, earlier this year, we launched a new uh, redesigned um, a update to the annual FOIA report data page. The new page, taking direct user feedback, uh, now is much more streamlined and combines all the functionality in a much more intuitive uh, way where you can make um, both basic, um, re run basic reports on your agency's data, but also more uh, advanced reports as well, comparing multiple agencies against each other or filtering down, uh, uh, filtering the data that you want per agency. Next slide. We highlighted this at the last uh, Chief Four Officer Council uh, meeting, but we're also very excited to continue our work with GSA 10X team uh, in working to find us a, uh, a solution that helps, uh, helps improve the searchability of the records posted in your agency's FOIA libraries. So essentially allowing uh, requesters to be able to search across all agency for libraries for information that is already posted online uh, to help meet their proactively meet their records request needs or uh, to potentially be able to help uh, identify the correct agency that where they may want to make the request or to even uh, even also to uh, help them maybe pr uh, uh, prov uh, make a more targeted request based off the information that that's already proactively disclosed. Um, we're excited to just have launched now into our phase two of this project with the 10X team, which will be a much more robust discovery phase and um, will include uh, a lot of uh, opportunity for us to engage with both the public requesters and agencies in, um, in getting direct user feedback on what this could look like um, and what would be the most helpful and efficient, effective way for us to develop this solution. Um, Next slide. We're also uh, looking forward to now soon, next as the next project, um, updating the quarterly report data page 
uh, similar to the annual FOIA report data page to make it more streamlined and also to make it easier for agencies uh, to provide this data directly um, through their FOIA.gov account. Now that uh, we're, we're coming to a phase where agencies are becoming interoperable with uh, FOIA.gov, uh, we're also taking a fresh look uh, at a discovery, an additional functionality um, that would make this site more robust and more efficient and eff more effective for both requesters uh, and agencies. And both for the 10X and our additional discovery, we're looking forward uh, to getting uh, to, to meeting with you, hearing your needs, um, and, and, and discussing potential solutions uh, and impacts on your FOIA administration, as well as meeting with uh, requesters and the public. Uh, so if you have, we will be reaching out, but if you have a specific interest uh, in working on these projects with us, uh, this is a great opportunity uh, for us to be able to hear from you directly um, what could be helpful and, and, and implement uh, in, into our process your agency-specific needs. So please feel, please reach out to us at OIP if you are interested in uh, being a part of any of these, uh, these projects on FOIA.gov. Next slide. We're also still working and planning on uh, updating our FOIA assessment toolkit. Uh, new modules to come on proactive disclosures in the administrative appeal process. We're also incorporating technology uh, uh, into each of the uh, modules, as well as uh, providing a new format so that it's even easier for you to use the uh, assessment where you can have, uh, where there will be a fillable version uh, where it auto populates um, information and it's much easier for agencies to use the toolkit. Next slide. And of course, lastly, I wanted to highlight, uh, we recently, just this past March, had a new uh, Supreme Court decision on Exemption 5. And uh, as you all know, Exemption 5 incorporates into the FOIA the civil discovery privileges. Um, and it has two requirements, a threshold requirement that information be intra-intra-agency, as well as for there to be a civil discovery privilege that applies. Here, the court focused on the deliberative process privilege um, and whether, uh, which uh, applies when information is pre-decisional and deliberative. The court's decision focus is on the pre-decisional element. Uh, and not to get too much into it with, uh, with the time that we have today, um, but we are going to issue guidance on the, the impact of this, the court's decision, um, and uh, that will be coming up soon, so stay tuned for that as well. Next slide. With that, I'll just pause to see if there are any questions. There's no questions on the chat yet. Okay, we obviously have a very quiet audience today, Bobby. <laughs> that, that's all right. We'll, we have, uh, we'll have the time at the end, too, for any questions. So if anyone has any questions right. on anything we, we've kind of gone through, please feel free uh, to chime in at any time. Uh, but with that, I will hand it over to, um, to uh, uh, Alina. Yeah, thank you. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so my turn uh, to give some updates to everyone listening with uh, joining us today. Um, some OGIS updates. Next slide, please. So one of several ways that OGIS tries to improve the administration of FOIA is through our work on the FOIA Advisory Committee, which I chair. Uh, the OIP director, Bobby, most recently, has been a continuous member of that committee. The committee brings together members of the FOIA community from inside and outside of government to collaboratively identify the greatest challenges in the administration of FOIA and develop recommendations for the Archivist of the United States. There have been three complete terms of the committee thus far, 2014 to 2016, 2016 to 2018, 2018 to 2020. You get the idea, every two years. The current committee term, 2020 through 2022, is in full swing, and four subcommittees have been working hard, legislation, process, classification, and technology. They're all actively engaged and meeting on a regular basis. We have created a terrific recommendations dashboard in order to keep track of the great work the committee has done since its inception in 2014. I have included uh, the link here. Uh, my thanks uh, to my wonderful staff at, in OGIS, 
I'm going to give a shout out to our compliance team in particular, um, Kirsten Mitchell, the compliance team lead, and Krista Lemelin, a uh, compliance team member who has uh, really been working hard on this dashboard and also uh, keeping keeping it up because that's part of the part of the um, the battle here. Uh, next slide, please. So as of today, the committee has made a total of 30 recommendations to the archivist, and we have advanced over 35 best practices. They cover a broad range of topics, all designed to improve the FOIA process and access to government documents. Here we have grouped them by general category. And this is just a snapshot from our website, and you can view all of this information and more. Next slide, please. So as you can see from this graph, we consider six of the recommendations completed, 19 are in progress, and five are pending. In other words, about those five that are pending, we have ideas about how to get them started, but there are only so many hours in a day. I want to address five of the 19 recommendations that are already in progress. Here at the National Archives, the pandemic has affected us as dramatically as at other federal agencies. But because a number of National Archives employees deal directly with members of the public at research rooms, museums, presidential libraries. They've had to retool during remote only work. Now our employees have been redeployed to other important projects that can be accomplished remotely. And OGIS in particular has been lucky enough to be able to draw the interest of five different NARA employees who are assisting with five of the committee's recommendations, three assessments and two training projects. I'm just uh, going to list them very quickly. Uh, recommendation number 2020-01, so the first recommendation of the 2018-2020 term, is an assessment of information agencies publish on their FOIA websites to help requesters with the FOIA filing process. Uh, this project will build on results of NARA's records management self-assessment that uh, we conducted in early 2020 by assessing compliance against guidance from OIP. And this project will inform further guidance on how agencies can improve online descriptions of the FOIA process that will be forthcoming from OIP at a later date. The second assessment is an annual performance plan view for 15 cabinet level departments and 103, I understand now maybe there's 104, independent agencies to see if these annual performance plans mention the FOIA. This project seeks a review of all uh, of these annual performance plans and follow-up um, to, uh, to be expected with a handful of agencies that do include FOIAs in, uh, FOIA mention of FOIA rather, in their performance plans to assist OGIS in possible recommendations to the legislative and executive branches. This is recommendation number seven from the last term. The third assessment is to help identify ways some federal agencies use to allow access to common categories of first party records without requiring a request under the FOIA and Privacy Act. Um, I will also mention that the current committee term is also looking at this uh, as well and is a hard at work, uh, but we're getting started and building on the results of the 2021 Chief Boy Officer reports that Bobby mentioned earlier, which asked agencies to provide a description of the types of first party requests that they receive and whether agency officials have explored establishing alternate means of access to those records outside the FOIA process. So we will be looking to those results. Uh, this is recommendation number 14. And there are two training uh, modules that we're going to be working on in collaboration with our chief records officers uh, training office, and we're very thankful for their help, um, and also in close collaboration with OIP. The first one is a development of briefings for senior leaders during transition to a new administration or any change in senior leadership that happens from time to time uh, to provide an understanding of FOIA resources, obligations and expectations, as well as records management. Um, opportunities exist for at-a-glance at resources for new chief FOIA officers, as well as senior agency officials for records management, SAROMs, as we like to fondly refer to them, um, as well as political appointees. This is recommendation number six. 
The second training uh, module is a development of targeted training in federal records management for FOIA officers and FOIA professionals, as well as a FOIA module, which already exists in part in federal records management training that the National Archives already has available. Uh, we'll be adding to that for all federal employees in accordance with both FOIA and the Federal Records Act. The training will focus on adequate documentation, agency file plans and record schedules, electronic record keeping, NARA's capstone policy for email record keeping, and best practices for conducting electronic record searches. Work on all five of these recommendations is underway, and we are excited to see the end product, which we will share with everyone when, read, when they're ready for prime time. Next slide, please. We have three upcoming opportunities for both FOIA professionals and members of the public to learn more about what is happening in the FOIA realm. On May 6th, our colleagues at the CDC will be discussing how they perform enterprise-wide FOIA searches in response to requests and responding to questions and, and comments. On May 12th, OGIS is holding its annual open meeting where uh, we will be discussing our annual report, which we hope to have finalized and published on our website by that date. And on June 10th, the FOIA Advisory Committee will hold its next public meeting with the report outs from all four subcommittees that I described earlier. So please tune in for all those events. Information is already up for the registration link is already up for the CDC event and registration information will be forthcoming, so please follow us on, on our event pages on the OGIS website. Next slide, please. So I'm going to pause for a second now to see if there are any questions on any of this before we move forward. Martha, any back questions? Yes, we did have a question that goes back um, to Bobby's presentation. What advice do you have for benchmarking? I understand there are deadlines and best practices. Is there a way to compare performance on various metrics with comparable agencies or components across the government? The averages and totals are less informative for comparison purposes. Yes, thank you for that question. That's a great question. Uh, so a couple of resources I, 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 would, I, I mentioned for that specifically. Uh, one is uh, I would encourage agencies of similar size and uh, nature. They can compare their data with similar colleague agencies on FOIA.gov. So you can see, um, you know, large decentralized agency versus medium, small agency, um, how your colleague agencies are doing. But specifically as far as benchmarking, we do uh, uh, emphasize certain milestones in the Chief FOIA Officer Report that uh, OIP then subsequently assesses. Uh, in the particular, things like, your average processing time for simple requests, uh, we want that to be as close to 20 days as possible, and so we score agencies um, based off of that. Uh, your uh, The number of requests you've processed compared to prior years, um, your, uh, your backlog, not just in terms of reducing backlog, but what proportion of your uh, requests are, are backlog, um, as well as your, old, your progress on closing your oldest requests, your 10 oldest requests, your 10 oldest administrative appeals, and your 10 oldest consultations. So uh, our summary uh, and assessment of prior years, um, uh, uh, Chief Forrester reports are on our reports web page. Uh, also, uh, the, the new guidelines uh, for 2021 are on our page, as well as uh, uh, milestones that we are going to be assessing from year to year. So I would, I would look to those as, as, as um, metrics and milestones to work towards every year uh, uh, as a benchmark. Okay. Martha, That's all for now. Thank question? you. Okay. Yes, great. It. Thank you so much. All right. So um, I think we're running about five minutes early, Bobby. That's the first for us. Um, so hopefully I, we've got on deck um, Eric Stein and Michael Sarich, who are our co-chairs of the Technology Committee. And on the agenda next, they are going to be giving us um, some updates. So I'm going to turn it over to them without much further ado and uh, ask our event producer to please go to the next slide. All right. Hey, good morning. Eric and Michael, you're on. Thanks. Thank you, Alina. Thank you, Bobby. 
Good morning, everyone. My name is Eric Stein, and I'm joined by my colleague, Mike Sarich. We're the co-chairs of the Chief FOIA Officer Council Technology Committee. We want to thank you for your time this morning. We put together a presentation uh, to cover what this committee has been doing since the last briefing of this group, and keeping in mind that some of you have not ever attended this meeting before, and those of you who are joining us again uh, will pick up where we left off last time. Uh, we want to thank you for your leadership and support in your respective agencies for the various FOIA programs, particularly with an eye on technology, and we'll be covering a variety of topics, including what we've accomplished and what's coming up next. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Sterich, and if we can go to the next slide, please. Good morning, and thanks, Eric. The Technology Committee is a creation of the FOIA Advisory Committee that Alina was just discussing. Uh, that body recommended to the archivist that FOIA leaders study the utilization and deployment of technology in FOIA programs uh, across agencies and identify the best practices and make some recommendations that can be implemented government-wide. And that's just what we're doing. We have over 40 members from at least 25 different departments and agencies, and we're always on the lookout for new members and fresh ideas. So now I'd like to run through our organization and kind of give you an idea of our focus areas uh, for the committee on the next slide. So for me, it's a real privilege to be able to share the, the work of, uh, of our members. Our group is an action-oriented body dedicated to providing tools to uh, FOIA professionals, and the contributions from these working groups are already paying dividends in the FOIA family. So initially, the Technology Committee put together a global look at the intersection between FOIA and technology, and we published that report last, last February. With that global perspective established, we pivoted to focus on seven uh, key areas that I'll kind of walk through now. The first one is FOIA searches. So how technology can assist with the adequacy of search, documenting search searches, and how technology is considered, you know, when you're thinking about how to and where to search. Um, the next two I'll take together, uh, the FOIA Express and FOIA Online. These groups exist to identify recommendations to improve these COPS products um, to better support FOIA processing throughout federal agencies using these tools because we have a, a body of folks using the same tool. We can kind of bring those folks together and uh, solve for common problems and look for, look for solutions to, uh, to common, uh, common challenges. The next one is artificial in intelligence. We provide tools to educate FOIA pr professionals about artificial intelligence, answer questions raised by various FOIA professionals and their agencies about the most appropriate AI tools. And as Eric will, uh, will share in the, uh, the accomplishments, we've already had some very successful uh, presentations on AI in the FOIA space, how it can be used for your agency, and, and so on. The next piece is 508 compliance and collaborative tools. This is really, um, a really interesting action-oriented group that's been focused on two areas of attention in the FOIA space. The first is kind of the explosion in IT tools and the implica implica implications, rather, pardon, in record production and improving processes. Um, the hurdles that 508 compliance can be for some agencies are, are addressed, so we can seek to put out as much information to the public in our transparency mission as possible. The next one is FOIA and classified information. Those are FOIA issues involving how technology is used for classified, classifiable, and then, of course, declassified information in, that, um, in the IT community. And finally, video redactions. We're reviewing current practices, challenges, and advances in the review, redaction, and release of video footage. We have an explosion of that record type being requested across the federal family, and there's challenges inherent in the production of those, uh, those record requests. So each of these groups has a charter that guides uh, its work. And now Eric will guide us through some of the accomplishments of, these, of our group in the next slide. So back to you, Eric. Okay, well, thank you, Mike. Uh, we have uh, accomplished quite a bit despite the challenges of the pandemic. Uh, technology has been that much more important to all of us in so many different ways, whether it be at work or in our own personal lives. And as we look through here, uh, we picked up in November 2020 uh, with our first presentation with our presentation that month on artificial intelligence and our chair for our AI working group led a presentation a virtual workshop an AI 101 session if you will to get our employees employees throughout the government familiar with concepts of artificial intelligence people jump to very specific interpretations of what they think AI is uh, we work to debunk certain myths and say here's what AI can do in a federal records landscape and here's how it could potentially be helpful in FOIA, and in recent discussions, we've, we've come across a lot of interest in 
uh, not just using AI, machine learning, and different concepts to help find and locate records, but also in how to apply redactions on records. And uh, while there's still a lot of work to be done with the, either the tools available at federal agencies, there's definitely an appetite and interest in mo- leveraging technology more uh, with the work of our employees, of course, to, to execute FOIA requests. So this session was excellent because it really provided a primer and opportunity, uh, a primer about AI and an opportunity for FOIA professionals to come together and ask questions about uh, anything on their mind and kind of put guards down and say, okay, what, what, do we, what, what do we know about AI and what don't we know and how can it really be used in FOIA? And is it being used at all at agencies right now for FOIA? Uh, fast forwarding a little bit to January and in between the November and January, um, time frame, we continue to work on our charters for the various working groups. As we briefed this body before, each of our working groups has a charter, and they're, they're publicly available on the OGIS uh, Technology Committee website. The charters were designed with, so each group has a clear, um, defined uh, scope and a list of deliverables. And after we, we achieve and complete those deliverables, we're going to determine whether we keep some of these working groups going or sunset, uh, sun, sunset them and then uh, create new ones for emerging topics uh, as they come out from our discussions, from meetings like this, uh, or just as they emerge as FOIA work progresses. So in January, we finalized our working, uh, our working group charters. We started the research for those deliverables. A lot of these charters had similar research deliverables where our, where our members of our committee and just a quick shout-out to those of you joining us today. I see several of you on the participants uh, uh, list here. Thank you for joining us. None of this works without the, our wonderful members who take time out of their, uh, their days to come work with us and uh, collaborate uh, on these issues. So our charters, almost all of them had a research component where we looked at past chief FOIA officer reports, the most recent ones, other publicly available information, uh, liaising and talking with other federal agencies, many of you here today, uh, and uh, just sometimes just getting feedback even from the public and other groups about different uh, concepts and ideas and taking that back and discussing it. So uh, that's what we were doing in January, and then February we ultimately published the charters online. So, uh, again, here's a link to it. If you're interested in reading about those charters and the, what we're doing in those groups, you can read about them using that link. Next slide, please. So in March, uh, we were very fortunate. Uh, we were able to participate in uh, two of the OIP best practices workshops, uh, the first one in the intelligence community and another one uh, with the broader FOIA community that doesn't work on national security information. Uh, it was a very uh, great discussion for FOIA practitioners to uh, discuss uh, some of the challenges uh, at the start of the pandemic, uh, what we've been doing in the year since, and what we're going to be doing moving forward. And uh, the technology committee was able to listen to uh, feedback from the different agencies and the different experience from the panelists and then take that back to our respective working groups and incorporate it into our research and deliverables. Um, with that, Michael, I'm going to turn over to you because uh, April 2021, this is really something that you've been leading. So why don't you talk about the uh, draft uh, video redaction paper and where we are with that? Great. Thanks, Eric. Um, so as we mentioned, each of the charters have, um, have deliverables, and one of the ones that uh, we've just recently uh, wrapped up the, the draft of is the video redaction paper discussion. And just to give you a 30,000-foot uh, view of some of, the, uh, some of the issues that the video redaction group has worked with is record retention schedules. Some record retention schedules for closed-circuit television might be 30 days, whereas others might be 75 years past incident in, the, in a law enforcement context. So dealing with just that scope of what is available for a, a legitimate FOIA request or a perfected FOIA request to ask for those records and whether you have to produce them or not, you know, it's all going to depend on the, the record control schedule. The different technologies that are available to FOIA practitioners to, um, to handle these types of requests, you know, do you have a, a Ferrari type thing with all kinds of bells and whistles that you can make the next, uh, the next iteration of the Mandalorian on, or do you have, um, you know, do you need something that's a little bit more stripped down that can, you know, kind of functionally get you from point A to point B without having all of those additional bells and whistles? It's an important uh, topic for in, that implicates both budgets, training, and the ability to have the folks uh, in your FOIA teams or on your FOIA shop that can actually uh, do this work. 
you know, in their current in their current roles and with their current skill sets. So there's a number of issues that the video reduction uh, draft paper has addressed, and we're going to look, and we're looking forward to getting that out to, to the wider FOIA community. And what that really does, I think, highlight, uh, as Eric and I often talk about, the action-oriented nature of this committee in terms of getting tools out into the hands of people, you know, into the hands of the FOIA practitioners across the federal family. And I'm really excited to share that the other working committees, the other working groups, are making just uh, as fast progress, and their deliverables that are in the charters are on their way toward uh, being met in the coming quarters. So with that, we'll talk about some of our kind of key findings uh, to date, and we'll toss it to, to Eric to talk about the misconceptions in uh, searches. On the next slide, please. Right, so, ne Thank you. so here, uh, building off of what Mike just said, this is kind of where the rubber meets the road. In addition to having some of our draft papers and deliverables now being circulated and prepared for public release uh, uh, according to the charter deadlines, um, which we're striving to accomplish, um, and you should check on that website to see those for when we post those uh, respective papers. We've been doing a lot of engagement with other agencies, and having done this now, I think we started in late 2018, we started the Technology Committee, and having worked through um, a year without the pandemic, the pandemic, and here we are now, we're learning a lot, uh, and we're seeing more and more uh, buy-in and um, engagement from our colleagues and many of you here with us today. So the first point here is probably the biggest, one of the biggest findings we've had since our last meeting, and that is there are major, major misconceptions about the ability of federal agencies to conduct searches of their electronic records for FOIA cases. And, and we say this to share for your awareness the, 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 uh, this, this, uh, these misconceptions can really skew uh, opinions and thoughts and, and understandings and, and lead to frustrations even uh, among requesters when they think that they contact an agency and we just hit a button and we can search uh, in a federated way all the different databases and archives in, in your custody. And we all, those of us in FOIA know that's not the case the would overwhelming majority of the time. And uh, I, we bring this up because we're, we're, or we have a searches working group um, that's uh, Going to be this, that's been discussing this, and we'll have the deliverable themselves. But understanding this from a dialogue, you know, especially with the public, of, of we just can't hit search on the terms you give us in one place. We may have to search many, many places. We have lots of different records coming in. Then we have challenges of deduplication of large volumes of electronic records, electronic data, different data sets that may not be compatible, and, and all types of formatting and other challenges. Uh, this was eye-opening for us because going back to our AI kind of 101 primer, uh, we may want to do something related to the electronic search capabilities to, to kind of lay out here's what our capabilities are, and uh, we, we do want to respond to requests that come in, but there are limits on what we're, we are and are not able to do. And I think also people will see that there's technology and really sophisticated advanced technology out in the private sector in different places and, and they may assume that we have those same capabilities in different federal agencies. That's not the case. I mean, some of you here today may, in addition to being your chief FOIA officer or just your FOIA officer of your agency, serve in the privacy office, or you have a, another role in the um, IT de department, or I mean, you may be wearing many hats. And so this is, may just be one of your many responsibilities. In some of the other agencies here, you, know, you are uh, you the chief FOIA officer role, and uh, you, you have to work with your chief data officers, your chief information officers. In some cases, you are the chief information officers. So the federal landscape is a little bit different in each agency. So this was a pretty big eye-opening um, uh, 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 discovery we had from discussions with the public and other agencies. And we're going to continue to, to build on providing clear understanding of here's what we're able to do and then working with our federal agency partners to execute the best possible searches given the technology available. Uh, Michael, over to you. Sure, and really, um, what we've seen in, in many in many ways is the ability of um, events, as we all know in the FOIA space, uh, events in the news drive uh, and can drive uh, FOIA requests. So certainly, agencies like the um, Centers for Disease Control and others, and me at the Veterans Health Administration, we've seen a tremendous uptick in requests related to COVID. Likewise, with a number of events that have happened in the community over the last year, uh, you've seen an uptick in uh, requests for video. You know, whenever you see things on the news, uh, large gatherings, folks, almost invariably there's a, a federal presence there 
taking video of that event, you know, either for evidentiary purposes or for, for whatever purpose, uh, legitimate governmental purpose there is to, to engage in that activity. So what we've seen, again, is an explosion in the interest of how do I process this request because it is a federal record created in the course of uh, business operations and we're hanging on to this and we're using this in our operations. Now we have an affirmative obligation upon request to produce this information. Oftentimes we have a desire to proactively disclose this information and we want to make sure that we're protecting the relevant privacy interests of the folks in hand. And so this has really been a huge issue for us, which is one of the reasons that I mentioned previously why I'm so excited about the work of the Video Redaction Committee and getting this paper out into the hands of the practitioners across the, uh, across the federal family. Uh, Eric, you touched on search al already with this and the, the importance of it. Um, would you like to talk about um, classification, getting that information out a as well as we move forward? Sure. Uh, we did touch on search a little bit already, so I, I won't go into too much uh, detail there, but just to say from our discussions uh, of the search working group, one of the things we're finding is we really wanted to highlight best practices and what works at agencies and, and beyond just like we use these terms or we use Boolean logic or we use uh, what, what tools or capabilities exist. What we found is it's been easier and, and a little bit um, uh, uh, more productive in discussions to highlight challenges we were facing, especially in this remote, hybrid, on-site uh, telework environment. And so we're really starting to drill down on what are the search capabilities the agencies can perform remotely and which ones require on-site work. Um, and, uh, and that ties nicely into classification. On, on classified information, of course, we can't go into classified information for a whole bunch of reasons here, but um, we, we can talk about there are challenges at agencies that deal with classified information or the declassification of information for public release through FOIA and what we were even looking at, which is very much staying in the lane of classification and FOIA, because there are a lot of bodies looking at classification and declassification matters. But with regard to FOIA, when you have classified information, uh, how different agencies are able to uh, work with one another with the technology they have, move records, comment, liaise, uh, provide feedback on referrals and consultations, uh, some of the challenges and limits of technology, given that some agencies, uh, you know, have more people on site than others, uh, what can be done right now and what can be done when, when we're in a better place in the pandemic and more people are on site and able to process this information. And I think one of the biggest and most interesting things coming out of this group is, again, how, if and how we can leverage uh, technology like AI or technology-assisted review in the future to help identify records that may be responsive. So, for example, if you're looking up a specific topic um, and you do a search of an archive or a database and you use three terms, um, using technology that will help you find maybe records that don't use those three terms but are very much related to that topic and uh, on classified systems, which has its own challenges and, and it's probably as much as we can say about that right now. But really good discussion, really nice group um, of employees working throughout the federal uh, landscape on the classification and class, uh, declassification environment. And, and finally, actually, I'll say one more thing. We are looking to make sure we're leveraging work already being done by agencies' declassification programs, which do review millions of pages annually for their 25-year review requirements for Executive Order 13526 and otherwise. So a whole lot of interesting stuff being done in this area, uh, but we're still uh, very much uh, constrained by the pandemic. And finally... Um, or at least finally for me, at least, before we turn it back over to Mike uh, on this slide, AI, artificial intelligence. And going back to this, the, we're seeing more and more in, in articles and coverage about AI and what AI is doing. What we found pretty much is that AI is being leveraged um, at agency, in some agencies, a small number, mainly more in records areas, not so much FOIA yet, but it's coming. We can see that there are certain tools and applications uh, for case processing, um, where AI is going to be available, um, it's not available already, and, it, or, and deployed more in the future. And, and this is going to be important because as we search these large volumes of electronic archives and get thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of, of potentially responsive records, the amount of time it takes to, to manually go through that large volume um, makes FOIA almost impossible in certain instances. And uh, we need to figure out a way to... Uh, work through the challenges of large volumes of data, uh, you know, a steady stream of incoming requests, as Bobby showed in that chart earlier, 
uh, despite the pandemic, we still received over 700,000 requests as, an age of, as, a, as a government this year, uh, and how to leverage technology in, a, in an ethical, responsible, and careful way that uh, helps uh, get to the intent of the FOIA law and transparency, uh, but while also making sure that we protect the information that needs to be protected appropriately, you know, privacy and other sensitivities. So um, what we're going to do next for our artificial intelligence group, we're looking at a couple of things. One is to uh, have some sort of uh, AI for federal employees, the uh, sec- uh, uh, part two training, if you will, building off of this initial you know, primer of here's what AI is. Um, and then also looking at, and this is a nice uh, tee up for uh, Mike to take over here, uh, what's out there in the private sector and for the public, uh, what, what tools are out there, what technology, uh, and, and, what, and, and what capabilities, because uh, and, and equally important, the needs of different agencies uh, vary so much that there are, probably, there are a lot of great solutions we've already seen out there, but then figuring out how, how do they become customizable and tailored to the needs of a specific agency in their uh, IT environment, in their own uh, ecosystems and, and interoperability, all the challenges. How, uh, there are a lot of great tools, but they don't necessarily fit within uh, an agency's um, IT infrastructure and landscape. So understanding better what's out there, uh, how to leverage GSA schedules uh, that already provide access to certain tools. And with that, Mike, I'm going to kick it back over to you for the final item on the slide because I think I've, we're, we're now ready for vendor day discussion. Great. Thanks, Eric. I appreciate that. And as Eric's mentioning, you know, artificial intelligence is kind of, uh, for some folks anyway, it's this mystical, almost uh, magic type of, um, of, a, of a topic. And when we see 100-plus agencies and multiples of, of, of that number of stovepipe organizations running FOIA programs, faced with the same challenges that everyone else faces um, with different levels of resources and different levels of bandwidth to be able to kind of attack this issue and this, this challenge, this kind of um, this uh, mandated requirement that we have to do. We have to produce these records in, in 20 days and, and get these things out and be as transparent as possible. We see a huge diversity in ability. And so one of the things that we believe in is, is a core, as a core is equity and kind of leveling the playing field, providing an opportunity for uh, FOIA practitioners across the entire federal family to be on the same page with everyone else in terms of knowing all of the best practices, having, having access to the tools that they need to tackle their mission. And so a piece of that is preparing a virtual slash vendor slash technology event where we can present all of these tools to the FOIA community, you know, the best of the best there to, uh, to do that. Now, as we all know that's fraught with challenges and making sure that all the T's are crossed and I's are dotted, and it's especially more complicated in the pandemic world to make sure that everyone that um, needs to be consulted is consulted, that everything is done, um, you know, in accordance with multiple sets of regulations. And so we're very fortunate and blessed to have uh, to have Bobby and Alina to work with on this. And the goal here is uh, coming up here in the fall uh, to have a virtual vendor technology event for so folks who may be in a small shop or maybe in a big shop can have access to and see the diversity of tools. You know, you may be in a shop where you're locked into one tool. Uh, you know, you, uh, for example, I'm at the Veterans Health Administration. We have an Office of Information Technology, and they selected the tool. So when I came to work, that's what I have. But if I would like to advocate for a different tool or for other tools, then it's critical that I know about them and that I'm able to connect with other people in the federal family who have used that tool perhaps or who have some experience in that area. And so ha- having this kind of community day, this, this day of, uh, where folks can kind of come together, ask questions, get the best, uh, the best information, you know, kind of candid advice from someone who may be using, you know, product A or product B uh, and learn. You know, we're still working out the details on how all, all of that would, uh, would comply with all the appropriate rules and regulations governing these events. But we think that this can be uh, potentially transformative because, again, the diversity of programs is so great. You know, 100-plus programs, tons of, you know, multiples of that, you know, folks working as a, as a lead FOIA officer in a, in a program in a stovepipe. You might be in a different, um, you know, component of an, of an agency running a, uh, a large volume uh, FOIA office, but you don't have the opportunity to connect and uh, liaise with different folks and learn about these, these different, different products. So I think that that's a really important piece uh, that we're going to be able to do, and we're excited to bring that 
uh, thanks to the great work of the folks on our committee, we're excited to be able to bring that um, to the um, to the FOIA community. And as Eric mentioned earlier, and we have some of our great committee members, all, uh, you know, as participants watching this, this work couldn't couldn't be done without without their great work, without the the hard work of each and every one of those members, uh, forty plus members, uh, you know, on the committee. So we're really really appreciative of, of that. And so we'll move to the next slide and talk about the things that we're going to be doing uh, in the future, our, ne our next steps. Sure, Mike. Before we go there, I just want to go back to your te just to the point on tech, the, the vendor day. And the, uh, whether you're a large agency or a small agency, one of the things we've really worked hard to do is make connections. Uh, we get we get contacted uh, by smaller agencies where like it's a one-person shop doing all these things. So uh, what we do is try to put you in touch with other small agencies or share what we've learned from these discussions. Uh, and a lot of it is uh, the agencies will share with us. Here's you know here's how we handled this solution. Sometimes it's helpful, sometimes it's not. But uh, we tend to find more times than not, it's it's helpful to collaborate and just know that you can come to this group and we will. Tr we're such a large uh, group in terms of our, our the, the the forty some odd members and the different agencies. Uh, and we, we the FOIA community, in the grand scheme of things, is so small. We're able to put uh, different offices in touch because we do get contacts about like. Uh, we get questions about, like, I don't have resources to do this. Or, it, as Mike just pointed out, my CIO shop or my IT shop put this together, and here's what I have. For those of you here today, uh, if you are the chief FOIA officer and you haven't done any outreach to your IT shop or your chief data officer or, or those different components that may be relevant to your FOIA program, we really, really encourage you to do so. Um, don't, don't underestimate the value and importance of that leadership role that you're in. And what we hear from our, our members of our committee and even just FOIA practitioners is having that support from leadership on high really makes a big difference uh, for at least identifying solutions uh, or uh, teeing up issues for potential solutions and even morale in general. And uh, even just with those two things, sometimes we're able to resolve problems. So, uh, Mike, yeah, that goes to the first here. Yeah, please. Sure, thanks. And, one of, and just to give you guys a, a real quick thumbnail, uh, best use case study for this, uh, recently, we have four different agencies that have one that has um, successfully implemented a tool, and three that were considering the implementation of this tool. Um, either they'd already bought it, and they're working on kind of their go-live schedule to talk about the best practices in implementing that tool. So, hey, what worked for you? What didn't work for you? What did you find useful? Uh, what drove metrics? You know, when you implemented this portion of that tool, what what really was the biggest bang for your buck when you did that? And to be able to have that kind of candid conversation among FOIA professionals, you know, to have that fora for FOIA professionals to come together and candidly share, you know, the uh, the pitfalls and the, the highs that they were able to achieve using these products has been been really really important. So it's just a quick best use case or use case of the power of, of this committee uh, to be able to bring people to, to uh, together. So talking about our next steps, as we mentioned, we have deliverables in the charters, and they're posted on the on the NARA. Um, on our website that we that we had in the link earlier, as we uh, as we begin to, to put those out, so for example, the video redaction paper should be out very shortly. Uh, we're going to post those there, and we'll do everything we can to make sure folks understand what that, that these are out and about. So um, please be please be looking for those. And these you know these are volunteers that have come together to improve the FOIA community. You know all of these volunteers that we have on this committee are just are fantastic. Eric and I are the two guys that are fortunate enough and lucky enough to be able to share their good work. Um, but really, the work that's gone on by these guys has been uh, has been fantastic. So uh, that's what we're going to be doing with the uh, draft deliverables. And then Eric uh, you can uh, talk to talk us through some of the workshops that we're planning. Sure. So uh, building on the different the AI session we already mentioned, we'll have a follow up for AI for FOIA professionals. And again, the, one of the things that we, our committee is focused on is building up uh, connections among our, the FOIA practitioners with an eye on technology and the tools. So we had this AI event scheduled, and we're looking at uh, potential other events based on the various working groups we have. Uh, first things, I think for most of our charters and our deliverables, we want to get the initial papers out and then uh, see what type of response, if any, we get and what, whether that leads to this. What happens often is when after we do our research, we draft the, the papers and start drafting, and we see all right, there, there might be an appetite for a discussion on searching of electronic archives or uh, how to work with classified information, which is hard remotely, but uh, or AI in general, and, and where where exactly we start? Because if we just jump in saying, "All right, here's how to use AI for FOIA," uh, and, and you're an agency that doesn't even have any, you're like, "Well, I just need a case processing system, or I still use Excel to track my cases," uh, we can really miss the mark there. So, um, 
we're looking at um, right now the next upcoming event would be the AI one, but there are other ones could be for the different um, search areas. But we also want input from all of you, um, whether it be from you specifically as the chief FOIA officers or your proxies or your employees, and that will steer the ship as to what we do next. Um, and then going back to, to the vendor day to you, Mike, for a sec, one thing, um, just you know, the point you made before uh, about uh, building off of the vendor day and the connections, even looking at shared solutions across the government, uh, where if one agency has a technical capability that may have cost a good amount of money to purchase, uh, before we have another agency go out and purchase a tool for something they may use once or twice or three times a year, if, if, if ever, uh, instead of wasting money and building and going and purchasing a tool you'll use once or twice, maybe leveraging agreements across agencies. This might be something for our colleagues and our other committee here, <laughs> the reports to this body, to look at. Uh, how can we leverage those agreements for, for technical solutions uh, so we can leverage lean budgets as much as possible? So, Mike, back over to you. Yeah, and what we're here in part is to solicit uh, feedback and input from, from this great uh, by all these chief FOIA officers. If there's a product that you think that we should uh, be going after on vendor day, you know, and saying, hey, we use this product. It's really been beneficial to us in, uh, in driving performance. We've been able to hit metrics A, B, and C because of this product. Uh, we've been able to either transform operations or this has been a consistent workforce for years that we've used, and we think that other agencies could probably benefit from, from this because ultimately – at the end of the day, we're all working towards making Bobby's presentations even better and better, right? Watching the, the, the delta between the, re, the request received and process, making sure that that process is over-received and backlogs are going down uh, and, and so on. So if you've got a tool or you've got an idea, we want to hear from you, right? We want to hear from you. We want to imp- have your – give voice to your voice. We want to amplify your voice. We want to make sure that we really are sharing the best of the best. So – if, you, if there's something that you know about and you have an idea and you say, hey, that, this would really be beneficial for uh, the larger family to know about, please send it along. Um, and likewise, as we identify new areas and working groups for 2022, as the working groups that, you know, we have that, that focus right now on those seven key areas, as their work wraps up, these are very energetic uh, folks and we've got a lot of people that are working to continue the iterative process of improving the FOIA programs and FOIA processes across the federal family. If you, there's a, a, an area in your program where you're like, you know, it would be really great if we had a systemic look at this, you know, on a governmental level about issue A or B, something that you may have worked on your entire career or something that may have just uh, popped up, then please, you know, send that to us because we're, we're a body with, uh, with open ears and active arms. We're uh, working, you know, all oars in the water, growing uh, to, to get to where we need to go. And uh, we can't get there without, you know, kind of active input. So, um, that's kind of why we're here. So we'll toss it back to, back to you, Eric, to talk more about, you know, kind of soliciting feedback from, from the FOIA uh, FOI Advisory Committee and others. Sure. Well, uh, I, I, just our point here is we're interested in feedback from all of you today. I understand there may be at least one or two questions in the chat, so we will open up for questions in a moment. Uh, but we're soliciting feedback from the FOIA Advisory Committee, uh, previously mentioned by Alina, uh, is a separate body uh, that is a public and private partnership. Uh, the ch- all of you at this, this uh, chief FOIA officer, uh, all the chief FOIA officers here, federal agencies, and the public. So if you do think of anything, just to reiterate Mike's point, please do share with us, and our contact information is on, uh, I think, one of the final slides. Speaking of which, we did add in an appendix slide here that we're not covering today. Uh, well, it's it, in the slide deck. It just shows um, what we briefed this body on previously on our object, what we accomplished um, in between the, the last meeting and the previous meeting. Um, and for the, so some of you may already be familiar with it, but if you're new, we do encourage you to take a look at what we, uh, we've been up to and kind of the long timeline of what, uh, what we've been able to get done over the past year. So why don't we go to the next slide, please? All right, so quite, here's the contact information I just mentioned. And at this point, I think we're going to open it up for questions. There's, I understand, at least one in the chat and anything else, uh, any other questions that have come in. So, Hi, this is Martha. Um, yes, we did get one question in the chat, which I think you addressed a little bit, but I'm, I'm going to read it out. Mis- uh, regarding misconceptions, has the committee addressed differences that small agencies face with technology challenges? Um, you mentioned the vast differences across the government regarding searching various databases, et cetera. 
the small agencies have even fewer resources available. And, you know, this also applies to vendor technology access. Um, this person's annual budget is less than $10 million, so they can't really afford a lot of solutions. Again, I think you've touched on this a little bit, but perhaps round it up. Sure. Uh, I think just a couple, a few thoughts. Uh, some would say $10 million is a huge budget for compared to some of the agencies we deal with because we've actually, and I'm sorry to kill again because I've used this joke before but or this comment before, but someone said we were talking about like interoperable technology and someone said, can I just get a new a fax machine or a new photocopier? It was a photocopier. Can I get a new photocopier? That would be really helpful. And the copier machine to help print out requests or digitize them. Um, so the, in terms of these issues and challenges, you have very, you know, small shops and operations, those challenges are just as real as those of us who are larger agencies that have, you know, millions of dollars and are processing, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of requests annually. Um, I would encourage you to reach out to us with specific questions or concerns because we'll drill down as to what exactly do you want, would you like us to assist with or what work, where do you think we could help you? But stretching lean budgets is something we talk about time and time again. And before we go into money, because it, it's, kind of it, it's kind of a trap, people will go talk about money and resources and people and uh, we, we try to really put our fingers on what the problem is, and if it's technology, we keep it in our lane. And if not, we then say, Bobby and Alina, we have this challenge that's kind of out of scope for us. Can, can OGIS or OIP help them? And, and they, they can take those issues. So uh, those are kind of my initial reactions. Uh, Mike, what do you think? Sure. I mean, Eric, to Eric's great point there, that a double-sided scanner, just something as, as simple as a double-sided scanner, has the power to double the productivity of an individual performing that task, right? And that's a very simple, several hundred dollar, or, you know, or less now, um, piece of equipment that can be put on someone's desktop, right? Um, so there are uh, very low cost, high productivity drivers that we seek to identify and encourage agencies to, to use that aren't using them. And what is great is the opportunity to talk to other folks who have had that light bulb moment already, because you know we're, we're limited in how many light bulb moments we have in a day, right? So if someone else has had that light bulb moment and they can share it and help address a, a challenge that you that you might have, you know, I think all of us frequently sometimes find ourselves, you know, so in the weeds of a problem, a uh, different agency's perspective can really, you know, a fresh set of eyes can really help point you in the direction of, of a solution and can make your life a, a lot easier because, as Eric mentioned, right, you get into money, you get into FCEs, you get into resources, you know, everyone is stretched thin and everyone's working at maximum capacity, especially, you know, these days in, in, the, in the COVID era. Um, so these simple solutions, these, this low-hanging fruit is out there for all of us. And having friends in the, in the community, in the FOIA community, to be able to help point you to, to, to some of these has been really impactful and game-changing for so many, uh, so many folks. Uh, but, yeah, that's, I would say that, yeah, you, there's definitely ways to do it. And, Please use our contact information. You know, communicate with us. You know, email Eric or myself, and you know, we'll share this information with you know with our larger community, the big uh, throbbing brain of the tech committee. And so often, great solutions come from 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 those folks uh, that we're so fortunate to work with. Yeah, and, and I just um, I I'd add there too. Oh, sorry, real quick, I just want to add on Mike's. No, go ahead, Eric. Sorry, couple 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 points that uh, just over the past year, really impressed by agencies that have figured out how to digitize mail. I mean, it's not it's not highly complex to scan, but to have people willing to come in, scan, especially at the start of the pandemic, before there was vaccine available, we had we had challenges where well, how do I work on cases remotely? And agencies figured out how to scan mail to make sure that it was digitized, including faxes. Now, uh, you know, some agencies already had that in place, but I think others have put in place. I know at least one or two have put in place the ability that faxes come in now. They're scanned and worked right and, and directly sent via email to agencies to start processing. Otherwise, those cases were just queuing up. Um, fax machines were just loading. You know, paper was coming in, but uh, there was no action because no one was in the office, especially you know, early March 2020. So uh, there have been some uh, practical examples of how technology has been used, and, uh, and, and some agencies just said, we, we don't even know where to start on how to digitize faxes, or who do I even talk to about a scanning mechanism? So they've reached out to us, and we put them in touch with other agencies or discuss, here's, what we, here's what's worked at a large agency, a small agency. Here's what you need practically, because I think that's where we actually get the best bang for our buck. People want to know, how do I do what they're doing? Um, and then they figure out what the, their issues with resources and otherwise. Sorry, back over to you, Martha. Oh, no problem at all. Um, the question that came in is, what are the top 10 productivity drivers for small agencies? I expect you all to have the exact answer for this right now. But <laughs> So 
I, I feel like uh, like we're on one of the shows. Like the top ten reasons are uh, we don't we I don't know if we have the top ten, but I can I can rattle off a few off the top of my head, Mike, and, I, and then uh, see what you think. I think uh, for small agencies, um, it's it's tough because some small agencies get a lot of FOIA requests, and some large agencies get fewer FOIA requests. But I, I think it comes down to the record types being reviewed and, and sought. And so uh, for a small agency, if, if there's if you have a or it's tough because we agency size is not necessarily um, uh, a great indicator of what type of FOIA requests and processing. I think if we go to the record types, if it's an agency that pretty much gets requests for the same form or the same standardized type of information, having tools that allow you, especially for technology, to do some sort of auto redact feature, or to like in this form we're going to redact boxes one, three, five, ten, fifteen, twenty. Um, that could be a big productivity driver because and a good uh, good return on investment because you want to do as much manual review and there's less room for margin of error of someone actually going through and just missing a box like that. Uh, for the agencies that do more reports um, and uh, narrative uh, driven products and and that are heavy on uh, uh, that uh, the what's in the content of their records very significantly. Um, I don't know if we have uh, just from a technology perspective, one great uh, recommendation here. But I think you have to look at the record types, and um, we can definitely take this back to our group to look at, um, but I don't think we've specifically looked at uh, the top five or the top ten for small agencies in general, but we have had small agencies uh, mainly identify challenges and try to help them with that. Mike, what do you think? Well, I think, um, so I put in the, in the chat um, our report from February uh, 14th last year, and the, the top drive, just in just in a minute, in a, th in a thumbnail, uh, senior level support for um, for your FOIA programs is really important, and that goes into what I call the Align, Assess, Act uh, model for running the FOIA program. And so, first, making sure that you're in a uh, that your agency is aligned, and people understand the importance of this mandated program that you have to perform and produce these these records. That kind of alignment is important from leadership down. And then the second piece for productivity is to assess your operations. The DOJ uh, toolkit is fantastic. Uh, we've used it at a VHA, and you can really go step by step by step. And the, the new tools that Bobby's going to release to the larger FOIA community, I would highly encourage you to use those because then you'll get a look at a small agency where areas that you might not be aware of uh, will come into focus. They'll come into sharp focus because you'll see how you stack up against a really solid benchmark. Now, not every one of those uh, areas may be 100% applicable to you, but you'll be able to quickly kind of get through those. And then once you've done that assessment, if you want to really drive pro productivity, act on that. So, you know, so align, assess, and then act. And then pretty much any agency or any FOIA program can find the success that, you know, we've been fortunate enough to have at VHA and many other uh, agencies have been fortunate uh, enough to have by taking a look at that, getting that leadership support, being, making sure everyone's in line in the same mission, doing an honest look, an honest assessment of where you're at and where you have to go, and then take action to get there, you know, set those benchmarks and, and and move forward there. And the tool is very simple and easy to use. It doesn't take a ton of bandwidth. And I think you'll be really, uh, really happy with your return on investment for the time that you put in for that kind of honest eyeball assessment of, of your program. And if we didn't uh, answer your question fully, we encourage you to follow up with us uh, afterward. Or, uh, um, and are, are there any other questions today? Nothing else in the chat. Okay, well, we want to thank you all for your time. And with that, um, like I said, we have an appendix slide here, um, and uh, we can skip it. We can go to the next slide and the next slide um, after this. Um, and we're going to we're going to hand it over to the Committee on Cross-Agency Collabor Collaboration and Innovation. Thank you again. Everyone be safe and be well. Take care. Thank you, guys. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Bell. I'm the FOIA officer of the Department of Transportation, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the COCACI Committee, uh, an acronym that has grown on us over the last few months. And my co-chair is here as well. Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Avi Mosheim. I'm with the Consumer Product Safety Commission. And Mike and I are here today to share with you news about the Chief FOIA Officers Council's latest committee. Um, we like to call it COCACI for short because it is a mouthful. Uh, we're a very new committee, a growing, vibrant committee. Um, and so let's 
get started and let you know how we're doing. Next slide, please. So last year, um, if you recall the last meeting, OGIS and DOJ announced the creation of the new committee. Um, and it came from Recommendation 16 of the FOIA Advisory Committee's final report, the 2018-2020 FOIA Advisory Committee's final report. Next slide, please. So Recommendation 16 uh, recommended that uh, the Chief FOIA Officers Council create this committee um, to look at research and propose a cross-agency grant program and other revenue sources for FOIA programs to review and promote initiatives for clear career trajectories for FOIA professionals, building on the GIS job series and in coordination with existing agency efforts, and to explore and recommend models to align agency resources with a commitment to agency transparency. Next slide, please. So our committee met in March, it was on March 9th, 2021, our very first meeting. Um, and we had the author of Recommendation 16 join us to go over the intent and um, objectives. And from that, we decided on the creation of three subcommittees. We didn't want to limit ourselves to just the recommendation um, points, the three categories in the recommendation. But the subcommittees that we have created do flow from there and also um, from the situation that we're all in now, which is the pandemic and how uh, we've gone from being in person and um, I know at least in our office, we had a mix of electronic um, production and paper production and now that it's all electronic, just the challenges that we're facing across the federal government in our FOIA offices and, and how we can uh, remedy uh, some of the, the challenges that we're facing, find solutions. So the three subcommittees that we created include pandemic virtual FOIA offices, government information specialist job series, and standardizing technology. And Mike is going to tell you more about those three subcommittees. Yeah, next slide, please. Uh, the committees that we have formed are pretty much in the, the new stages. Uh, where we just started forming them, and we're going to start setting up uh, timelines over the summer and come up with charters. Uh, but we have gone ahead and come up with some goals for them, and that's really what I want to go into uh, at this point. Uh, our first one, because it's the big elephant in the room, uh, the Pandemic Virtual Offices Subcommittee. Uh, I think all of us know by now or keep it in our heads that uh, we've been uh, working from home, max telework, uh, for over a year now. Uh, all I know is uh, I don't know what day of the week it is sometimes, and I had to Google how to tie a tie today. Uh, but I do know that my first day of teleworking was March 16, 2020. Uh, that was a Monday, and there really wasn't much uh, lead time to it because uh, we were just thinking, okay, do we have enough work to keep everyone busy for two to four weeks You know, when we're away from the office? Uh, and that's what everyone was thinking at the time. And so there wasn't a whole lot of pre-planning that uh, went into this telework because it came on us so suddenly. Uh, however, uh, the offices, not just FOIA offices, but everyone across the government adjusted really quickly and came up with a lot of really good ideas. And uh, many of those have been talked about in some of the DOJ uh, best practices forums that they've held, you know, to keep people uh, informed of what's going on. Uh, but what we want to do with this committee is to actually take a deep dive into those ideas and see how we can really implement them uh, across the government and also how we can maybe transform them for when we go back to the offices in whatever form that is. Uh, because we all know it's not going to be business as normal when we go back. Uh, more than likely, it's going to be some kind of hybrid uh, FOIA office. You know, instead of going in five days a week, people may only go in for two days a week. Uh, which is different than, you know, tell everyone teleworking at home. So we really want to look at ideas and how we can uh, transform them to uh, uh, work once we get back into this new, uh, the new normal, which everyone's been talking about for the last year. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the second subcommittee is about the GIS uh, job series. Uh, the GIS job series has been around for about a decade now. 
Uh, I worked on it, implementing it way back uh, when I was with DOD. Uh, you know, we changed the job series. We tried to make it independent from just uh, being admin workers. Uh, but there hasn't been a whole lot really done uh, since then. So we're trying to see how agencies can actually benefit from having this independent job series. And you can see some of the things we're going to focus on. Uh, recruiting for uh, positions. Uh, there are plenty of good FOIA people out there, uh, but it's tough to try to get them to apply to your agency. So we want to see how we can uh, you know, help along with that. Uh, career advertising. Uh, very few children want to grow up to be FOIA officers uh, when they get older, you know, except for maybe Bobby. You know, he's probably the exception to the rule. Uh, but most of us, uh, we got into it because we saw maybe a job offer out there or, you know, something on USA Jobs. Uh, so we had to find the job or the career. Uh, what we want to do is try to, you know, find a way to get those good people and recruit them into the government and into FOIA uh, because we can't depend on just, uh, you know, these good people that are out there just accidentally finding FOIA. We want to go out there and get them. And finally, uniformity in grades. Uh, we know every, every agency is different. Uh, that's pretty obvious. Uh, but we want to make sure that uh, certain functions uh, align with certain grade levels. We just want to make sure that uh, agencies are on the same level with that and on the same page. So, you know, when you uh, hire other people, uh, you know you're getting a person with the right uh, qualifications and experience. Uh, finally, the final two items there, uh, cross-agency details and cross-training. Uh, these are kind of ambitious uh, goals that we want to take a look at, uh, but... You know, really, we think that these might benefit small agencies, which is what we've been talking about. Uh, I work at the Department of Transportation. Uh, we have a lot of FOIA analysts across uh, many different offices, different operating administrations. So we, we actually have a good detail lead program that we try to take advantage of to give people different experiences and, uh, you know, so they can just learn a little better. But if you're a one-person FOIA agency, you know, that's tough to do. And while we know there's going to be, like, funding uh, issues, uh, we just want to take a look at uh, how we can really pull something off that, you know, a FOIA person from a small agency can maybe spend maybe even a week or two somewhere else and, you know, get a different perspective on their job. So uh, that's one of the things we're going to take a look at on that committee, subcommittee. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, our final uh, subcommittee is just about standardizing uh, technology. Uh, you know, there's plenty of ways to say, you know, use Program X, you know, FOIA Express or FOIA Log. Uh, but if you don't know the right way to use it or if the agency doesn't have the proper resources, it's not going to do you any good. And the technology committee that we just heard from, I mean, we've got, they're kicking butt right now with all the solutions that they're coming up with. Uh, but we want what we want to do is just to complement what they're doing and to just make sure that agencies have the right infrastructure and processes in place to take advantage of these solutions. Uh, because good technology really doesn't do anyone any good if you're not using it the right way. Uh, I just always think back to a, poor, a phrase uh, that I heard, uh, a poor, it's a poor musician who blames his instrument. And, you know, it's easy to blame technology if we're not using it right. So we want to make sure that all agencies are on the same page, that phrase again, with how they use technology and make sure that uh, they're using it in the right way and just make sure that agency resources are aligned to take advantage of the technology that's out there because it's changing very fast and there's no way we're going back to a, uh, a paper world. So all FOIA offices have to be ready to take advantage of it. And as people said, the smaller offices, uh, it's tough for them because of budgets. If we can find a way to uh, put a process in place that they can use this technology, uh, that would definitely be uh, a success for our committee. Uh, next slide, uh, that's the end of the committee part, but uh, I know Alina said earlier, uh, talking about recruiting members, uh, our committee is brand new. Uh, we're a little under half the size of the technology committee, so we're, we really want some good people who want to work hard. Uh, as Avi said, we're not limiting ideas. If another subcommittee comes up from an idea that we uh, receive, uh, we're going to go mm -hmm. with it. So uh, email either one of us if anyone's interested. 
And uh, I guess we'll see if there are any questions. There are no questions in the chat at this time. Okay. We'll definitely okay, email us and let us know if you have any additional ideas for subcommittee topics or um, if you want to join our committee, we would welcome you with open arms. Um, so we look forward to working with everyone and, and thanks for having us today. Yep. Thank you all. Here's my Thanks uh, very much, Abby and Michael. Thanks again. <laughs> Take yeah. care, guys. So I know we're running a few minutes behind schedule, but um, I will um, now ask the event producer to please flip over to our other slide deck. And I am very excited to introduce um, the CDO Council Chair, Ted Kauk, and Vice Chair Dan Morgan. Bobby and I had the good fortune of being able to present at a CDO Council meeting earlier this year, so we are returning the favor, although they're doing us the favor by being here, so we really appreciate it. Uh, Ted serves as the Chief Data Officer at the United States Department of Agriculture. In this role, he is responsible for developing strategies that enable USDA to fully leverage its data as a strategic asset, improving organizational decision-making and outcomes for citizens. He was selected as the first chair for the CDO Council due to his expertise and leadership in data analytics. That's at least what your bio says, Ted, so I know you're living up to the hype. Um, Dan is the Chief Data Officer of the United States Department of Transportation. He has overall responsibility for the departmental data program and data compliance across the department. He is responsible for establishing a clear vision of the data managed in DOT and the application of DOT data for decision making. He serves as data strategist and advisor, steward for improving data quality, liaison for data sharing, and developer of new data products. Wow, damn, that's a lot. Okay. Uh, so, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks. Uh, well, thanks, Elena. Hopefully you can hear me, and uh, it's great to be with everybody today. Thanks, Dan. Um, so, really excited to just uh, engage with this community and with the public and talk a little bit about the work of the of the CDO Council. Um, maybe we can go to the, the next slide. Um, uh, but just to put in context some of the background around the CDO Council, I think just even thinking about the uh, the recent administration's focus on on data, um, really on on how the major challenges we're trying to address, whether that's COVID nineteen or economic recovery or or climate change uh, and equity, uh, really how those executive orders signal the importance of uh, the broader data work in government and a need for reexamining how we collect, use, share, and disseminate data. So um, many of those executive orders are. Are unified for a call by uh, for better data management practices, skills, and infrastructure. Uh, thinking about the executive order on adv advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities, um, they've established a data working group that's going to study and provide recommendations on uh, inadequacies in federal data collection activities and policies and infrastructure. Um, there's a, a call for a data-driven response to COVID-19 and, and looking at our data collection and sharing and publication practices as well as uh, the need for privacy protections. Uh, there is an emphasis on talent and data skills that are needed to support these activities. Uh, and um, really just holistically, when you look at those executive orders, the work that we've been engaged in in the CEO Council is, uh, really helps to reinforce the, the importance of that work and to, and to challenge us. Um, in terms of the, the CDO Council itself, um, the Foundations for Evidence-Based Policymaking Act of 2018 uh, required that all agencies in government for the first time establish uh, chief data officers, and uh, it also established the Chief Data Officers Council. Uh, so our council now includes approximately 80 members from both CFO and non-CFO Act agencies across the government, and um, we're responsible for implementing the federal data strategies individual actions at our agencies uh, and, for, and for creating data-driven organizations in, in partnership and I think that's where the collaboration uh, is going to come into the discussion today with, with our other Evidence Act officials, including chief boy, uh, chief boy officers and, and evaluation officers and statistical officials, uh, as well as others. Uh, our, our vision uh, is to lead transformational change that improves the nation's ability to leverage its data as a strategic asset. And um, some, some of the conversations we've had recently after about a year of working uh, to stand up the council and to, to understand our work better is, is really our, our ability to have a vibrant learning community uh, to ensure that CDOs and that profession are advanced, but also 
uh, how we're collaborating with other councils across government. So um, uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, we have some statutory responsibilities. And so in terms of uh, supporting, uh, supporting those and also supporting the current administration priorities, uh, we're really uh, engaging in, in these kinds of things in, about, in four ways. Um, gathering input from the public, engaging and in, in understanding uh, uh, the uses for and priorities around improved data collection and dissemination, um, working with our community to understand the good work that's, that's been going on for many years, but how we can leverage those best practices for, for CDOs and our, and our partners in the data, in the wider data community to improve age, agency data collection, data governance, data sharing, data skills, data inventorying. Um, and then also building uh, capacity uh, across government so that we uh, are building our practices in a way that they're informed by a, a data ethics framework that advances equity, uh, reducing bias in our data, looking at our data science practices. Um, we have a number of, of priority projects that we're engaging in to prototype and look at solutions. Um, and then this broader uh, opportunity to collaborate with, with other Evidence Act councils and, and other uh, data data focused councils like the FOIA Council is one of our major kind of priorities to support these statutory goals. So going into the the next slide, um, just also talk about our our work to support uh, implementation of of the federal data strategy. Um, as as many of you may know, the first federal data strategy was kicked off in 2020. Uh, the the action plan outlines some um, some pretty aggressive uh, actions and milestones that are that are foundational work. Uh, each in agency uh, was implementing, has been implementing individual actions, uh, identifying the data needed to answer priority questions, standing up data governance boards, assessing our data and related infrastructure maturity, uh, doing data skills assessments at our agencies, uh, and really looking ahead to uh, updating our open agency open data plans and, and publishing and updating our data inventory. So we've been supporting. Uh, the work of, uh, of, of that uh, federal data strategy through the community building and through our um, development of best practices as well as our working groups. And we've set up a, uh, a structure to help us to implement that. So we'll go on to the next slide and just take a quick look at our overall uh, structure. Uh, we have a, an executive committee. So both Dan and I serve a, a, as chair and vice chair on the executive committee. We have a membership from uh, the Office of the Federal CIO as well as from um, OIRA in, at, at the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, we have, uh, obviously, in our larger council, we have our um, our agency CDOs, and I think really critically, our ex officio members from uh, councils like the like the FOIA Council. And then we have a number of working groups that both align with the administration priorities, but also are uh, like on COVID nineteen, uh, where we're working to uh, support uh, common decision making tools and. Uh, sharing information uh, across agencies um, and, and giving broader access to public health data uh, that's needed by our individual agencies to support safety of our workforce and ongoing operations. We've also established other other working groups that are um, really designed to, over the over the short, medium, and long term, improve our ability to share uh, to to improve data sharing practices, data inventorying, and data skills. Uh, and so that's where the collaboration and, and our are teaming with the the you know the great uh, not only the knowledge that the individual CDOs have but also their broader organizations and our ex officio members and the councils that are working uh, together with us and so I think Dan will be talking a little bit about some of our our planned activities for uh, for twenty uh, for twenty twenty one this year but also uh, more detail about some of the collaboration uh, sort of structures we started to put in place with the other councils so I'm going to turn it over to Dan to to talk about the second half of the presentation. Thank you. Sure. Let's go ahead and jump to the next slide. <clears throat> so obviously, um, as a council, we have to meet. Um, like you, as a FOIA officer's council, we're quite large. Um, uh, every agency has a CDO. Uh, not every agency has other Evidence Act officials, so not every agency has a statistical official, and not every agency has an evaluation officer. Um, so at CDOs, you know, we're in interesting places where not our, our, all of our membership isn't equally engaged across evidence activities um, because of the nature of the statute. But we set up a variety of discussion sessions on things like federal data strategies, uh, action plans, and how agencies um, how agencies are addressing some of those actions. 
Um, as Ted mentioned, we've got our ongoing working groups. Like you, some of our working groups are newer than others. The COVID-19 working group was one of our first ones. Um, I think it's important to remember the CDO Council was only established January of last year. Um, and so we've, you know, we've, we've been forming, storming, and norming in the middle of the public health emergency. And COVID-19 was top of mind uh, for us as we started to form uh, our work. Um, we, are, we, we, we have a website now. It's cdo.gov. Um, and, of course, we've got, uh, we are still working on how we're going to work on public engagement and doing things like you do with public meetings. So we have an opportunity to learn how, um, learn from you as a Chief Boy Officer's Council about how to make this virtual uh, meeting format work well. Um, of course, we use uh, internal collaboration tools across government. Uh, many of you who are inside government are familiar with OMB Max. Our, our OMB Max site is open for everybody, so if you search for Chief Data Officers Council, you'll find our materials um, and no need to request access. But I really want to double down on the strategic linkages piece and the cross-agency council work that we've been doing. So one of the things that we recognize early on is, is that data is really a team sport. And to, to, to that, that point, we have identified a number of other councils that exist where we can collaborate on projects together, where we can share ideas across councils, where we can attend each other's working groups to be able to share information across boundaries. So we've actually set up a number of ex officio relationships <clears throat> with the Chief Evaluation Officers Council, with, this, with the Chief Information Officers Council, um, with the Privacy Council, um, the Inter Interagency Council on Statistical Policy. Um, I'm proud to say that we have a relationship with Bobby and Alina uh, as the Chief FOIA Officer Council ex officios. Um, we've also established one for the Federal Records Management Council with Lawrence Burr, the Chief Records Officer of the United States, serving as the ex officio. Um, and we have others like the Federal Geograph Geospatial Data Committee. I do know that one of the things that came out of the FOIA Advisory Committee is a recommendation for more collaboration across the FOIA and Records Councils to the CDO Council. And we're going to continue working with Bobby, Alina, and Lawrence to figure out how best to make that work to meet the spirit and intent of that recommendation and how we can work together to make sure that CDOs understand how data is currently managed under the Federal Records Act and the FOIA, uh, but also how we can work, how we can leverage some of the things that you are doing with your technology committee to understand how advanced technologies can help us both be successful. One of the things that we have the advantage of, of working on um, through the CXO Council process um, is that OMB operates a, um, uh, operates a funding process called the CXO funding process. The pro projects that we have underway there are uh, data skills workforce development very soon, we'll be releasing a data skills um, playbook for folks to see. Um, we've also been working on sharing dashboards across agencies with an emphasis on human resources and diversity. Ted's been leading a project on natural language processing uh, for public comments. Um, and the Department of Interior is leading a project on um, interagency collaboration on wildland fire fuels. Um, as we see the new administration coming online, we expect an update to the Federal Data Strategy Action Plan, and we work closely with the Office of Management and Budget to provide meaningful input uh, from a CDO Council perspective on what the action plan says uh, so that we can help CDOs effectively implement the action plan. Those are our key activities here in FY21 and probably heading into FY22 as well. Um, and we'll have some new projects that will be coming online. Uh, but that's, that's, what, that's our focus area right now. I think we have time for maybe one or two questions if there, if there are questions in the chat. Um, there's only one question in the chat. Someone wanted to know if political appointees are part of the council's membership. No. Um, so the, uh, every CDO is, a, is required to be a career official. That's all. Although, I, yeah, I think the only clarification I would make there is that that's true with regard to CDOs. We do have representation from the Office of Management and Budget, so uh, it certainly is possible that we could have membership, but not at the current time. Good point. Thanks, Ted. 
Okay. Well, thanks very much, uh, Ted and Dan. We were really happy that you could join us today. Apologies that we're running a little behind schedule, so thanks for hanging in there with us. And uh, we hope to have you back. And uh, we'll continue this collaboration. This has been just great. And we've had a couple people ask us for your PowerPoint presentation. We'll make sure that we post that on our website and um, give access to everyone to that. So thanks again. I want to express my appreciation as well. Thank you so much, Ted and Dan. Thanks, Bobby. Thanks. And everyone, all the slides, um, all the slides are already on our site. Look at the chat, and I've posted it a couple times in there. Great. Thanks, Martha. I really appreciate it. By the way, the the amorphous Martha is Martha Murphy, the OGIS Deputy Director. Um, she has chosen not to be on camera today, but I'm sure she is always camera ready. And Martha, thank you again for monitoring the chat and and helping us with all of that. So, Tegan, if we could uh, go back to our slide deck, the next slide, please. All right, so we have now reached um, the uh, public comment section of our meeting. We did promise to leave time for that. Uh, we look forward to hearing from any members of the public who have ideas or comments they would like to share. Uh, we would like to open up our telephone lines now. Tegan, if you could please provide instructions for our listeners for how to ask a question or uh, make a comment via telephone, that would be great. All right. At this time, if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, please dial pound two on your telephone keypad. You'll hear a notification when your line is unmuted, at which point please state your name and question. Once again, dialing pound two will indicate that you wish to ask a question or make a comment. Okay. I also want to remind everyone you may also submit written comments. Uh, please email them to OGIS Open Meeting, all one word, at NARA.gov. We will post any written comments we receive on our website. Any oral comments uh, will be captured in the transcript of the meeting, which we will post as soon as it is available. So, uh, Martha, um, can I turn to you first? Any questions or comments from the public via the chat function that have come in during the course of the meeting? Uh, we only had one question that came in through the YouTube chat. Um, someone had a question about uh, classification and FOIA. Um, and maybe we can just clarify the overlap. The question was, why do some FOIA officers refuse to declassify records and claim that FOIA is not for declassification, whereas other FOIA officers do declassify historical records using the B1 to B9 redaction? So I can, uh, I can speak to that just generally. Um, of course, when applying Exemption 1, um, agencies are, are, are responsible to make sure that the information is properly and continues to be properly classified. Um, but if information is withheld at Exemption 1, uh, there is a process to be able to challenge that classification and have that uh, freshly reviewed to determine if it should continue to be declassified. Uh, and so that process is there. Uh, and of course, classification only relates to Exemption 1, um, but obviously there could be overlapping exemptions. Um, so hopefully that, that responds to the question, but more generally there is a process um, for if you believe that information should be declassified uh, to challenge the cl actual classification. Thanks, Bobby. Um, Martha, anything else on chat? Nothing else at this time. All right. Uh, Tegan, do we have anyone on the, on the telephone line who would like to chime in? I'm not showing any questions or comments on the phone at this time. Once again, if you would like to make one, please dial pound two on your telephone keypad. Okay, we're going to give folks a couple more seconds to think of their comments, but um, please know that the Chief Way Officers Council is happy to receive comments at any time. Um, we'd love to hear your, your thoughts, comments, feedback, um, things that you would like to see in the future. And that also, of course, includes all of our FOIA colleagues who are here with us today. If there are any particular agenda items you would like for us to include in our next Chief Way Officers Council meeting, uh, Bobby and I are very open to that. Right, Bobby? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Well, I am pausing for a second. Um, if there are no other chat questions or phone questions, I think we can actually wrap up our meeting on time. Yay. Excellent. Nothing here. Okay. Nothing here either. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Martha and Tegan. So uh, Bobby and I both uh, very much hope to have another CFO council meeting later this fall. 
Um, please stay tuned for further announcements on an exact date and time, um, as well as registration information. I predict that it's probably going to be virtual again, although everything is a little bit up in the air, so bear with us. Um, uh, thanks, Tegan, for advancing the slide. Uh, thanks again to all of you for joining us today. I hope everyone and their families remain safe, healthy, and resilient. Bobby, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Elena. And thanks for me, for everyone, for uh, joining a really great uh, meeting today. But a special thanks to uh, our, uh, our presenters, particularly the, uh, the uh, two co-chairs of the uh, committees, uh, and especially um, for all the people who are uh, on those committees for all the great work. Uh, just one more last plug, please. Please reach out if you want to uh, if you want to participate in any of those committees. Uh, and as Elena said, uh, we are very open to your thoughts on what the next uh, meeting should look like. Okay, uh, Tegan, next slide. This was um, Mike Sarich's contribution, so I just wanted to make sure we got it in there. Um, thanks again for joining us today. Uh, have a great day and stay safe out there. It's supposed to be a very windy. Take care.